Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, my sis, my lay, actress and award-winning fertility advocate, Kalei Stewart, talks to me about the willingness to grow. When Kalei decided she was going to freeze her eggs at 37 years old, it wasn't her first choice. But when the opportunity presented itself, she was willing to take it. I truly believe that willingness is a key to life. We have to be willing to adapt and grow. When you are unwilling, you risk blocking yourself off from the very things you want. But if you are willing, you open yourself up to new possibilities. What am I willing to do? And if I'm not willing to do it, what consequences do I then have to accept by closing those doors off? And sometimes if we don't know ourselves, we don't know that that's what we're doing. You have to be willing to try something new. You have to be willing to come out of your comfort zone. Hi, Lay. Hi, my Ashley. <laughs> Welcome to the pod. I'm so excited you're here. I'm happy to be here. I'm actually really, really thrilled. I love your voice. I love your energy. I love your mind. I love your Aww. heart. This is the perfect thing for you to do. Thank you, sister. I love you so much. I'm so excited you're here. Um, let's start with how did we meet? Tell the story of how we met, if you remember. <laughs> I feel like I've known you forever. So to be able I to know. find the actual origin story of it, is actually hard to me. Do you know, I know it was through the Lena Waithe like atmosphere, but where exactly did we meet? I think we met at the infamous, in like a very good way, uh, New Year's Eve party that Anthony Hemingway had. <gasps> in like okay, New I, Year's I, Eve. I, yeah, it was New Year's Eve, I think of 2012 going into 2013. Yeah, it was. Okay. Well, then if you ask me that, Ashley, like, forgive me because I was probably drunk. If it was New Year's <laughs> Eve and it was an Anthony Hemingway party, <laughs> that means yeah, I had that's at least probably... five glasses of champagne. Yes. And he had that barbecue oxtail that he made. I just, Yummy. it was so many people. I met so many people that day. And so many of you are such a big part of my life still. Um, yeah. And like, we've just been family and friends forever. But yeah, yeah. I think that's where we met. And we've been that sisters ever since. That makes total sense. We've been yeah. sisters ever since. And that's why I didn't know the exact origin because I feel like you've always been a part of my life. I know. Champagne it's or no weird. champagne. It's weird. <laughs> so I'm glad that you remembered that. But yeah, you're a forever girl. So yes. that's the way it is. Yes. And so much has happened in our lives over the past, I don't know, what is it now? I guess 11 years that we've known each other. So I'm really excited to to get into it and just talk about our growth and our journeys and our trials that turned into triumphs. Um, but before we get into that, sis, I want to start with some icebreaker questions. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> okay, so what... Um, Spirit feeding travel have you done recently? I, I saw that you went to Bermuda. Um, and I there might be somewhere else you went to, but I would love for you to talk about like what that trip meant to you and, and what the trip was for and and how you feel after the trip. My beautiful parents, who we lovingly call Mama Stu. Ashley yes. knows Mama Stu <laughs> and uh, Papa Bear, who's my daddy. Um, both are turning 80 years old. And so about a year and a half ago, we planned this cruise to Bermuda, which is where they honeymooned 56 years ago. And they have never been back to the island since that honeymoon. We sailed on a cruise ship to Bermuda. We docked and we went to the hotel that they honeymooned at. And so here they were with their children, with their grandchildren in the place where it all started just mm. days after their I do 56 years ago. And on the property, even though it's been renovated, there was a, um, there is a marriage ring on the back of the property where new couples stand inside of the ring and take photos. Oh. 
And that was there when they were at the same hotel 56 years ago. So we were able to stand with them and be the product of not just their love, but their sacrifice to Mm. stay together. Um, I'm not married myself, but I do understand from an outside perspective, the amount of work and compromise and self growth and healing that occurs as you grow with your partner in and out of all of the years. So to be able to stand there and hold their hands and know that, wow, you really got me here to this day to be able to celebrate 56 years of marriage and 80 years of life. Oof. So when you ask me what it meant to me, everything, everything, especially because I'm at an age where a lot of my friends that I love so deeply um, have lost a parent or two or both. And um, knowing mm. how lucky I am yes. and blessed yes. I am to be able yeah. to continuously create memories with them um, mm. is huge for me. So we cry and we yeah. laughed <laughs> and we, we celebrated and we prayed a lot. Mm. Prayers of gratitude. So it meant the world to me. Mm, I love that. <laughs> like it's, you know, I, I always, I talk a lot about legacy on this podcast because um, for me, legacy is always the goal. Like in creating my own family, I, 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 th- the first thought in my mind was what type of legacy are we going to be able to create? You know, because you know, at some point in my life, I would love to to do the exact same thing you did with your parents, right? Like take our kids and our grandkids back to where we got, you know, married or honeymooned or whatever it may be. Um, and it's it's such a beautiful way to look over your life and say, wow, look at all that we've done. Look how much God brought us through. Um, and look at the legacy we've created. And, you know, Lay, I, I love you and I know you personally, but your parents did a great job. Like they, they did it. They really, 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 really did it. And like the work you do in the world, the work you do in your, in your just everyday life, the work you do in your friendships and with the people that you love is uh, a reflection of who you came from. And I think that that's really, really big. And I'm, and I'm really proud of you and I'm proud of your parents. So cheers to them. Cheers, cheers to, them. to them. Mama yeah. Sue will be very happy when she hears that. Yeah, because, <laughs> because, you know, parents often ask themselves the question, you know, did I do it right? Did I mm-hmm. steer you wrong? You know, one of the things that my mom has always said to me growing up is do all the things that you want to do before you get married and go after your career and travel and do all of those things. And so now that I'm in my 40s and I'm not married. We recently had a conversation and Ashley, she began to cry Mm. and said out loud to me, did I advise you wrong? Maybe I should have told you to look for love. Maybe I should have told you to prioritize that more. And I held her hand and I said to her, mom, if I wasn't healed and I chose love instead of choosing myself, I would have chosen the wrong partner, married the wrong person, and we would be having a different conversation right now. Mm -hmm. So you did exactly what you were supposed to do and said what you were supposed to say based off of what you knew at the Mm -hmm. time. And there should never be any regrets in that. And Mm -hmm. my story is still being written. So I had to tell her, don't worry, I'll get there. There will be a day where I go to that marriage ring with my husband, but Mm -hmm. you did everything to the best of your ability. And I'm so, so grateful for that because I wouldn't be the woman that I am without it. But it's interesting that you say that because even those that we outwardly see as doing so well still inwardly have their own trial Mm -hmm. of feeling like, did I steer my child wrong? For me, the answer is absolutely no, but we're constantly questioning those things. Yeah. What, um, what's an experience you've had with your dad that's left an indelible mark on your heart? 
that like you'll always remember. It'll always stay with you. It changed your life maybe in some way. Ooh. It could even be a lesson um, he gave you at some point in your life. You know, it's interesting because if I'm honest, me and my dad butt heads a lot. And we don't speak necessarily the same language. I'm very bullheaded at times. I can be very stubborn at times and very much in control of what I want to do. And so taking advice from my dad sometimes wasn't always, you know, easy for me. But as I matured into my womanhood, I think one of the one of the most amazing experiences I had with my father was explaining to him that I wanted to freeze my eggs, my fertility. Mm. And that was something that wasn't offered to my mom or that generation back then. So that's new to him. And not really knowing whether or not he was going to understand what all of that meant. And lo and behold, um, I remember when my father sent me a check, I think it was about for like $3,000 to LA that said, you know, this is to your egg fund and going, oh, he does see me. He he Mm. does know me. And he wrote this beautiful note about going after my dreams and believing that the time will come and that, you know, no matter what, daddy's always going to be there. And you are going to be a mom. And I pray that I stay alive to see it. All of those Mm. beautiful sentiments that only a father could do, um, he did. See, it's bringing me to tears now. Oh, God, it's making me emotional too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, man. Because, you you know, you you never know how your parents are going to react when you feel like you're not giving them the experience that they may want for you. Yes. Whether that's yeah. college, whether that's your career, whether that's marriage, whether that's grandchildren, I wasn't able to give that to them yet. And I always wanted to just make sure um, that I offered them the option. And so when he showed up, when I was giving that option mm-hmm. to myself and therefore to them, um, that meant a lot to me. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, it's it's in those moments. Like you said, you were like, oh, you see me. You, he, you're his child. You're his child. Like your happiness above all else is important. So I'm just so grateful that even in a time uh, that felt very scary and like you were embarking upon something that you knew your parents had no reference for that you felt that support and that love in such an overwhelming way. And from your father, especially like that, I I can see just how um, healing and encouraging that must've been for you. Yeah. It really was because my mom came out here to help me freeze my eggs. So I know he was alone when he wrote that. And I know Mm. that he didn't quite understand the whole process. And he was, you know, in the house in Pennsylvania thinking, how do I, how can I be a part of this journey with her that fe- that feels very isolating and feels very much like, oh, this is what women do. And this was his way of being present. And mm. um, that note I will keep forever. And yeah. like you said, he's my dad. He's my daddy. And mm-hmm. um, I'm always going to be his little girl, no matter how old I get. Always. Which yeah. is just so lovely. I, you know, I'm a daddy's girl. So like, I it's, I love it. It just brings me so much joy, all the joy. Yes. But I want to talk about mamas too, too. What about you and your mother are very close. Anybody knows Lay and Mama Stu are attached at the hip. And it is <laughs> the most beautiful, lovely thing to witness and see. You guys are like, you guys are like, sister daughter mom like relationship it's like there's like a sisterly thing about you guys the way you guys hang but also she's your mama and you're her daughter like you see it's it's such a beautiful fluid relationship in so many ways and so i 
want you to tell us what about, like, what is the essence of your relationship with your mom that has encouraged you um, and inspired you so much to be a mother yourself? My mother's willingness to grow with me. Mm-hmm. First of all, my mom is my mom first. She's a disciplinary first. She's a parent <laughs> first. You know, okay. Like yes. she's like, even, even in my forties, you know, she she's still the <laughs> boss. Okay. Um, she gonna get us together too. If we have to be gathered, we'll we'll get gathered as well. She will gather you. She will gather you on site too. And it's it's a skill. It's a beautiful thing to witness. And you just hope that you're not on the other side of it. But she has gathered my friends. She has gathered all of us. Um, with that being said, but she also has a softness to her where she's willing to grow. And just because she's the matriarch of my entire family, actually, mm. extended family, It doesn't stop her from having enough humility to know she doesn't know everything and that as long as there's breath in her body, there's still an opportunity for her to learn how to be a better person, how to be a better woman, how to be a better wife, how to be a better mother, how to be a better grandmother. Mm -hmm. And our connection comes from the fact that I'm still trying to figure out who I am And in the course of that, I'm watching my 80-year-old mother still be opening to figuring out what else she's about. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. And so our friendship part of our relationship comes from both of us being, you know, women, people that identify as women and the issues that come with that, but also our willingness to be flawed in front of each other and help each other get to the other side of that and open up those blind spots. That's where our friendship really thrives. Yeah. I love that you're saying willingness because I recently had a chat with a friend and I was commending her and and her relationship. And like, and I was like, you know, the thing is you both have such a willingness and it was a word I don't think I've ever even really used the it's a word that I like I realize I don't use very often because it, it doesn't apply to as many situations as I as I think it should. But to me, a willingness is almost like the key to life. If you are willing, if you have a if you have a true willingness to achieve, to attain, to uh believe, to like whatever it may be, then I really believe that you can do it. And, and and it can a willingness also allows you to connect. It it brings people together. When you're unwilling, you're blocked off from things. It's it's, a, it's an tell immediate you, barrier, right? You are preaching something right there. Now that right there is a whole sermon. I had a falling out with a friend, and it was very 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 minor. And it was a man, and he had said to me, "You know, you gave me a second chance, and you didn't have to." And I responded to him, I chose to. Mm -hmm. We never have to do anything. Mm -hmm. We can absolutely close every door and then years from now, look around and wonder why nobody's there. Because you closed every door. You have to be willing to correct things with people. You have to be willing to try something new. You have to be willing to come out of your comfort zone. And allow yourself to be an 80-year-old person that's still willing to learn a life lesson. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're saying is it's an optimal word that we all need to really pay closer attention to in our behavior. What am I willing to do? And if I'm not willing to do it, what consequences do I then have to accept by closing those doors off? And sometimes if we don't know ourselves, we don't know that that's what we're doing. We can stand on a soapbox of, I deserve better. Sure you do, but people are people. We could stand on a soapbox of, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't need a man. I just want a man. If you want to to have that kind (laughs) of attitude, (laughs) see how far it's going to get you. For me, 
I need companionship. I need friendship in my life. I need healthy people to emulate, to teach me something. I'm never going to be a know-it-all and be unwilling to compromise or empathize in this life that I live because I know that I'm going to need it to come back my way. So Mm -hmm. yes, be willing, be willing because somebody else is going to have to be willing on your behalf. You're going, everybody's going to need willingness at many, many, many points in their lives. Period. Like, and and it almost is making me think like what, what I would encourage even you and I to do, listeners, make a list of the things, be honest with yourself, of the things that you are willing to do and you are unwilling to do. Right. And you you're going to have to reckon with yourself and be like, but why am I unwilling to do X, Y, and Z? What is what is right. it about what is it about these things that that I'm telling myself I will absolutely not do these things? And That's and, and, key. and I would encourage you to to potentially reconsider because as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm like there's not Many things, I can't even really think of like three strong things that I'm just unwilling to do. Like, and and I think, and I think the truth is having willingness means that you have an ability to surrender. Because when you're willing, you're submitting to like, I don't know always what I'm willing to do, but I know that I don't want to block myself off from whatever it may be and say that I'm completely unwilling. So I surrender to whatever it may be around the corner. I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing. And, and maybe you get there and you're like, okay, maybe I can't, but allow yourself to be um, willing before you are completely just blocking yourself off to, to something. Okay, Lay. So I want to, I want to pivot now. I want to talk about these eggs. We got to talk about these okay. eggs. Okay. So yes. take us back to the moment that you decided to freeze your eggs. But I also want to know what did life look like? pre-freezing for you? Like what, what, what type of world were you in and what was the moment that stopped you and you were like, you know what, I need to do this. And now? I was a series regular on a successful television comedy for many years. I was in a seven year relationship with a gorgeous man that I originally met in New York that, um, both of us were out here in LA and I fell in love and I unknowingly was dimming my own light and minimizing myself to suit his life and where he was or wasn't at the time um, in terms of career and accomplishments and where he wanted to be. And so I unknowingly was making myself smaller to stay inside of this relationship. And because I gave it seven years, I felt as if I needed to continue to give it my all because I had invested a lot of time. And because I was lying to myself and not really looking at the situation as ways, seven years, no ring and seven years and no plans for the ring and, you know, all of those different things. I then started to wake up to the fact that not only was I giving him my time and energy and commitment, but I was giving him my biology. Mm. Women are born with as many eggs as they're ever going to have. And when I recognized that my future was now in the hands of someone that had no intention of making me his wife, I immediately got out. Mm. And it was gut-wrenching and it was hard and it was difficult to think of myself as single at 37 years old in Los Angeles. It was scary and it was embarrassing. And I don't Mm. think people talk about that part as much Hmm. where you're in a relationship for a long time or a marriage a long time and you feel like a failure on the outside when people realize, oh, it's over. 
So part of the reason I stayed is I was embarrassed that I couldn't make this thing work. But when I got the courage to finally remove myself from the relationship, it was on a Sunday and the Philadelphia Eagles were playing the New York Giants. He's from New York. I'm from Philly. And the Eagles won that day. Just got to put that Mm. out there. (laughs) And I turned to him after they won and I said, I'm out. I'm done. I'm leaving. I need my life back. And I remember he walked out the door and I didn't cry, Ashley. Mm. I called a few friends. One of them we know, his name is Nico. Mm -hmm. The audience listening may know him as Uncle Clifford on P Valley. Yes. And I said to Nico, I'm not even crying. Like it's over. He left. I'm not even crying. And Nico said something so profound to me. He says, sis, you've been mourning this relationship the whole time you were in it. Nico and his words, what are we going to do with him? Like When I woo. tell you, in that moment, I said, God, you know, what do I do? And I heard in my spirit, go freeze your eggs. It's not over. It's not over. Had you even go been thinking about it, though? Were you thinking about it? Was it like... Very briefly, it was kind of like God was sending me the pebbles. Uh I had asked a couple of people, have you ever thought about freezing your eggs? I asked a woman that was my showrunner at the time who had a child in her 40s, did you freeze your eggs or how did this come to be? So I had the the snippets. I did. Okay. And I had thought about it and I had asked the little questions, but I didn't get the confirmation to God that this was my route until that relationship was over. Mm. So the minute that he walked out the door and I got off the phone with Nico, I heard God say to me, Go freeze your eggs. It's going to be a while. Not only did he tell me to do it, he let me know the time for me to be a mother was going to be a while. It's delayed, but this is going to be something that you need to do. Whether I use them in my physical body or for surrogacy or whether I get pregnant naturally, I didn't know what God was going to use them for until I did it. I called Mama Stu. I did it right away. I got a new credit card. I put the whole egg freeze on there because where God is, it should flow. I remember calling my gynecologist on that Monday. By Wednesday, I was at the fertility clinic checking my follicles and looking on the Mm. screen. I saw it all. It made sense to me. I got the card. I put it on there. And two months later, after that breakup, I had 29 eggs in the freezer. When you can hear God clearly, when there's When all the things that aren't supposed to serve you are removed, you will know the steps to take. And what I didn't know, Ashley, was that that experience would be used for me to educate myself and use my platform to speak to communities about infertility and reproductive health. So God is using them already. I mean, wow. So God told you that it was going to be a while. Yes. How did you, were you okay with that? Have have you been okay? (laughs) No, I'm going to be quick. Listen, because he's omnipresent and he's all the things doesn't mean that I don't get angry. Doesn't mean that I agree. Doesn't mean that I don't get hurt by how God has, guide in my life, I just know that on the other side of it, it will make sense. I just know that the provision is always there. When I heard it's going to be a while, I was absolutely livid with God. Mm -hmm. You know, why didn't you get me out of this relationship sooner? Why didn't? And he was like, I didn't put you in it. You had to grow through that. Right. I never put you in it. So I had to grow into the woman that understood all of the things I learned in order to leave that relationship. And then God was like, okay, now I can talk to you. So no, I did not like what it sounded like that it was going to take a while. But now that I'm an award-winning fertility advocate, Mm. I can't imagine having a child without this journey first. So this while, taking a while, 
has been used in such a way that I have participated in the blessings of so many people that I know and so many people that I don't even know getting to their blessed child. Mm-hmm. This is the while, this time that I'm using right now to pour into people that identify as female, people that identify as male, pour into the community about reproductive health and knowledge and knowing your worth and knowing how to not give away your biology. This is the while God is using me. And he's using those eggs when people say, well, when are you going to defrost your eggs? And are you going to go to a sperm bank? When are you going to use them? I said, baby, if you don't see these eggs being used, you missed it. Mm. They're being used. They're being Mm -hmm. used. They may not be born yet, but their purpose, even before their birth, is being used. And that's something I never saw on the horizon. But I'm so proud because when I do have my child or children, they'll be Mm -hmm. able to look back at this time in my life and say, wow, mommy, you did all of that just to get us. And not only just to get us, but with us. With us. That's the thing. We're already connected. Yes. Yeah. You know, I really want to encourage women to just go to the doctor and see what's up. Like it's. It it just even if you if if you feel fine if everything's fine if if all the women in your family or whoever in your family has been fine just make sure that you still go and check it is still your right and it's important to just know you know I uh, ex- experienced what they call unexplained infertility mm-hmm. so, you know it was a year and a half of them being like we just don't know what's going on Ashley I I I don't know what to tell you you know what I mean and and we it's a bit of a different journey, but we were encouraged to pivot to IVF and egg freezing. Um, And I am so happy we did because after going through so many things, so many months of unexplained infertility, and then like, like you said, meeting with the doctor and it making sense to me and just having a willingness to say, I'll try this. Let's see how it goes. And the amount of peace that I felt on the other side of of egg freezing, I cannot explain. I, it was an exhale. I didn't realize I had been holding my breath. I've been holding my breath for years, basically. Like, I, you know, so many thoughts. I think so many people go through this. Like, can I get pregnant? How will I get pregnant? Will the baby be okay? Uh, how many eggs do I have? Do I have it? Like, there's so many thoughts that I think we just go through life uh thinking that they're they're normal thoughts but they're thoughts not to say they're not normal but they're they're very consuming thoughts that's more so what i mean they can be thoughts that are quite consuming and the the peace that i felt on the other side of knowing that i too had eggs in the freezer i was like oh my goodness and i'm with you i am an advocate for just really encouraging people to just go see what's up get get your blood work Talk to somebody, talk to your doctors and see what's going on. Well, first and foremost, I just commend you and I love you and I adore you. And I'm so proud of you for sharing that and using the microphone to make a lot of people feel less alone because unexplained Mm -hmm. fertility, especially because can be that kind of diagnosis where you can't even tell me why, (laughs) you know, where it feels so incomplete because there's not an actual answer, but it's such a high percentage of why sometimes sperm and egg um, don't create uh, the pregnancy that we thought it would. Um, And so that can be very, very heart-wrenching to your point, willingness, which Mm -hmm. I think is the theme of this (laughs) conversation Yeah. You know, I think, again, you have to have a willingness, a willingness to pivot. Like we talk a lot about pivoting on this podcast. I had to pivot. You had to pivot. Coming out of your relationship was a pivot. Freezing your eggs was a pivot. You didn't think you were going to have to do, but it's it's something you did. And we both can agree that we both are really grateful that we did. Amen. And I will even venture to say for myself, at least, and maybe you have a similar experience that it brought me closer to God in the sense that 
because this is trials to triumph. For me, triumph is the closer I get to God, the bigger the triumph season I am living in. And Mm. anytime there is an obstacle in the way of how you thought things were going to go, whether that's in relationships, whether that's in career, whether that's in becoming a mother, that obstacle, that trial is inevitably going to bring you closer to God. Your prayers, I can probably imagine through the process of IVF became so much more deeper and your understanding of what God was doing with you and Daryl became so much more deeper. And then all of a sudden, because it wasn't as easy as we think it should be, because we have this perception, we drew this picture and God has Mm -hmm. already had the bigger story written. Because it wasn't as easy as you think it should be, it forces you to your knees in a different way to say, God, why me? God, what are you doing? God, will I ever be a mother? God, is this going to work? It forces you to get closer to him. The freezing of the eggs that I did was an elective procedure in order to preserve my fertility for later use. But it still Mm -hmm. brought me to my knees, Ash. Because I was still at a place of, God, why didn't this relationship work out? Why didn't I leave him sooner and find the one I was supposed to be with? All of those things. And what I will say is that it's a decision I will never regret making. And when people ask me about this and I offer this to you or anybody that's going through a similar experience, I always tell them when they say like, well, when do you think it's going to work? Or when do you think it's going to happen? Or what are you going to do? I always say, don't look at my circumstances. Look at my God. Mm. Because I've had to tell that to myself. In the waiting season, you carry weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, while you're waiting, W-A-I-T-I-N-G. And I had to remind myself, if I just focus on my circumstances, that I'm not focusing on my God that put me in these circumstances for a power that is greater than this moment. Mm. We will both be mothers. Maybe yes. not the way we yes. thought it was going no. to happen. <laughs> it's not. But <laughs> we are in this club now with the greatest members. Yeah that got closer to God because they were willing to pivot. Yeah. Sis, what has been your takeaway from our conversation today? Willingness. (laughs) Yeah. It's probably going to be my favorite word for the rest of 2023. Um, And asking myself what I've been unwilling to do or willing to do in this season. What you said about making that list. I'm going to take your advice myself and do that list and ask myself Mm. why, encourage myself to reconsider um, the things I'm unwilling to do and make sure that I'm not leading with ego. So thank you for that, Ashley. Willingness is what I'm taking away. Mm, I love that. My, My takeaway is that It's amazing what God will do. Like who could have predicted that you and I would both be able to share the experience of egg freezing and like uh, our fertility journeys. Like we, we were able to relate to one another in such a special way. And I'm just so grateful that I have you that, you know, I've always had you as, as a sister that I've been able to look up to um, and be inspired by. And I'm also just one of my other takeaways is the reminder that like, you know, you're an actor, Lay, but you've always been so much more than just an actor. And I'm so, and, and I relate to that. And so I'm really encouraged and inspired to witness you in the season where you are showing your full the fullness of who you are and how many multitudes you contain. Um, because the convergence of all of it, like I said, is 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 world changing. And I'm just really grateful to be a part of it with you and like hold hands in agreement with you. Thank you. I adore you. I receive that. Let me say that. Mm. I receive that. 
I receive that friend and I echo it back to you because you're the most talented of chocolate girls that I know. And at the Thank same you. time, you have so many ways of feeding into the culture and the world and making it a better place with your vision and with your truth and with your ability to speak your truth into power for other people. And mm-hmm. one, one of the last things I want to say, Ashley has this way of celebrating her friends on her birthday. And oh. one of my favorite, <laughs> it's her birthday. We're supposed to be buying her a gift and going to brunch to celebrate her and blowing out her birthday candles. And yet and still, <laughs> you will be in tears because Ashley will stand up at the table, give a declaration to everybody around the table about how amazing they are, and then leave them with a gift because she celebrates her birth by celebrating the people that make her life full. And one of your birthdays, you gave us mustard seeds. Mm-hmm. Um, it was my 30th. It was your 30th, 30th birthday, birthday, mustard seeds, mm-hmm. so five years ago. And uh, for faith. And I took those black mustard seeds, by the way, that you gave, and I put them in a jeweled golden egg that I have, that is my faith egg that I look at to remind myself of my journey. And it actually has a little compartment inside the egg. It opens up and the black mustard seeds that you gave me on your 30th birthday sit inside that egg. And Mm. just know when our babies are playing in the grass barefoot, because that's what (laughs) we're going to do. And one day, Ash, I'm going to pop out that egg and those mustard seeds. I'm going to say, girl... Look, Look at, at us, us now. now. <laughs> we said at the same time, I love you. I love, I love you, you so too. much. I honor you. I thank you. I just, I'm just so grateful you're in my life forever and ever. We did forever. it. Forever. I love you, honey. I love you. Sis. We did it. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Our managing producers are Fatima El Swiffy and Paulina Velasco. Shanice Tindall is our lead producer. Associate producer is Mona Hassan. Jordan Thompson is our marketing coordinator. This episode was mixed by Trin Lightburn. Michelle Baker is our video editor. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you did, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one.